Calling all units, calling all units. Donut Shot has a fresh dozen. Go ahead and take a 1040. And we're back. Here we are. Salute, my brother. Welcome to the show. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. Boom. Cheers. There it is. All right. So you're going to drink? Yeah, yeah. yeah you're going to drink, drink and I'll wait. If you know, it's bad luck if you don't drink. And then apparently, if you don't look the person in the eye. Seven years of uh, mean, bad. Bad. What is it? Sex. Bad sex. Bad sex. Mm-hmm. <laughs> With that person. <laughs> <laughs> With the person that didn't look you in the Ooh, eyes yeah. or whatever. <laughs> oh, man. We got a good episode. Woo! It's going to be good. We have Dave on the show, and um, it has an interesting story to tell, okay? And we're going to get into all, all about this story, right, Jay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're going to get into this story uh, later on, but you want to give like a little snippet in the beginning to let the audience know, hey, this is some good stuff you're about to hear. Yeah, so I was a police officer for 20 years. I was friends with a tiny homeless man, four foot nine homeless man, and for 15 years, just regular friendship, but... Um, after 15 years, one day he just said, Dave, it's time I tell you my life story. He told me the craziest story I could ever have heard as a police officer. Uh, 10 days later, he gets killed in a really bizarre way. I spent five years of my life researching the most interesting man on the world <laughs> to ever, you know, yeah. uh, come across your come path. A- yeah. yeah. So, uh, it's, it's quite an incredible story. It is. It got like a little bit of CIA in there. Yeah. You yeah. got some uh, Vietnam craziness that I heard. Yeah, from uh, the bloody jungles of Vietnam, I did the investigation to Iraq, Venezuela, Cambodia, and uh, that whole rabbit hole of conspiracies. Super, super interesting, and I, I came across it on TikTok. It said, uh, Miami Cop Tells a Story or I forget what the, the name was or something. And then I was like, Miami Cop, let me see who this guy is. Yeah. And then uh, I looked you up, and then turns out that you worked at the same agency as my uncle. Yeah. So I was like, yo, Theo, you got a hookup, bro? <laughs> and then we got in contact, and then we, we hit it off. But it's been making its round on, t- on TikTok. A lot, of, a lot of views. A lot of views you're getting on TikTok uh, uh, covering the story, little snippets. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. Like, there's no flashy things in it. It's just me just kind of relating the story in a couple of minutes, and it just seems to have captured people's attention. Uh, obviously, uh, it's a pretty sad story, but it's also pretty inspiring. So yeah, um, we, when we get into the nitty-gritty, it, it'll, oh, yeah. it'll get there. So stay tuned for all that nitty-grittiness. And I'm going to do something that I want to, I want to break some ice in here, okay. even though it's kind of, uh, kind of warm. Yeah, it's a little toasty. It is a little toasty for Randall, some reason. Randall? In, in our new studio at Fed's Apparel. Yes. <laughs> Guys, we're broadcasting from Fed's Apparel. Um, your uniform needs, all in one spot right here at Fed's Apparel, or you can go to fedsapparel.com. I even have a little section in there. You want to go buy some merch? I got a section in there. Hey, we could put your, your book and everything in there, too. Fedsapparel.com. Go there now. For all your uniform needs. Ba-doom, ba-doom, oh, wow, you really <laughs> was that made, good? You really made that a commercial. Was that good or what? <laughs> that was strong. Hey, so um, we, we like to talk about police stuff here. Yeah, the name of the, the show is the Donut Shop Podcast. So imagine we're, we're all cops. We, somebody walks in with an interesting story. We're like, hey, man, sit down. I got a, got a couple minutes. We start talking. And kind of like your story, I guess, where you meet. And over the, over the time, you learn about this person. This is the whole uh, idea of this podcast. With that being said. I was out the other day, and uh, I, I went and bought some food, and it was takeout. So I get there, and I'm like, ah, all right. The, the, the lady gave me the thing to sign. It said tip, and I had this question. What is the proper amount to tip on takeout? I know Justin does a lot of takeout food. Oh, yeah. But you're old school. That is the craziest thing because I think about that all <laughs> yeah, the time. You see what I'm saying? And I'm embarrassed to ask somebody. I'm always embarrassed <laughs> you, to say because they do nothing. They, they get it from the kitchen. They hand it to you. Yes. But you feel bad, so you always give something. I mean, in a regular restaurant, it's 20 25%. But yeah. I always try to throw 5 or $10. That, that's, that's my rule of thumb for just walking what if 60 feet. Wait a minute. What Go if ahead. it's a coffee? What if it's a little cafecito? Oh, what if it's a little man. cup? That's a, that's a, you see what I'm saying? I might pretend like I didn't see the tip, oh. but, yeah. but you know, it's, it's funny. A I, made, I made a I made a real strange observation. So now, whenever you go to a supermarket, you go to any uh, grocery store, while you're checking out, they're asking you for tips. They're asking you to donate money. There, it's like Jehovah Witnesses come running yeah. at you, so you yeah. don't get a chance. Like no. you're you're. 
killed with all sorts of money, people asking you for money, just as you're just trying to check out. So it, it's, it's it, a, they a turn, phenomenon. They turn that big screen around and they say, yeah. hey, hey, here you go. <laughs> right. Well, how much of an asshole are you going to be? Right. You go to the pet store. You want to help pets that have been beaten up? Like, oh, my God, of course <laughs> I want to help. You know, it's like they got you on the hold, right? And the people in the line are like, yeah. look at this asshole. He don't want to give yeah, money. Yeah. <laughs> you know? you want to donate and right. then you're looking back. Hey, can you keep your voice down a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. But what is he? He he beat around the bush. Five dollars, ten dollars. You said on, yeah. a, on a takeout tip. But how big is your order? You well, see what I'm you saying? look twenty thirty dollar order. But on on a coffee, wow, that would be a tough one. You like, see what I'm saying? I might pretend like I didn't see the two. You thing. see what I'm saying? What so, do you think? So what so here's you? what I say. I'll I'll start first with that. You know, on a coffee or whatever. For the most part, if it's your your job. You know, no. I mean, you're a barista. You made a coffee. Okay, that's. I don't really need a tip on all that uh. stuff. But if, but I and I know from friends that uh, that work in restaurants. One of the things that you're doing, like say Chili's, for instance, because they've had takeout for a long time. You're you're a lot of times a server that would have had a section, but you're rotated in for that day and you work the takeout. So you need so to know you, the infrastructure right. of the business before you get so, the tip. But let me explain this to okay. people. Yeah, okay. so let me explain this to people. So you rotate in there. So if you're expecting normally like whatever, your hundred, hundred and fifty dollars in tips, you'd work for your section. Now if you're getting cheap skated out by all of us, yeah. then you're going home with fifty dollars or something like that or less. Because I know a lot of people that I've seen on the social media going, Man, F that, F that. I'm not tipping them for but one of the things and I've heard from a friend who used to work the takeout stand, what they're doing is, you know how you get it, everything boxed up nice and stuff. That's not the, the dudes in the kitchen. That's the takeout server usually prepping the food, setting it up, making sure that you got your forks and knives and all the little extra stuff that you asked for in your Uber Eats order and all that kind of stuff. All that is what they're doing and then they're setting it up. But again, I also go off of their attitude. If so you how walk much into do the, you tip? I'm usually in that five to ten dollar yeah. range. I'm not doing like ten percent. So like, if my order's sixty five dollars, I'm not giving them thirteen bucks or twelve bucks or whatever. So I'm you, usually giving them between five and eight. Eight percent. Eight bucks. So would you say like more? 10, just a flat. Would you fee. say ten percent? Yeah, yeah, ten percent. Sometimes, like if the if the tip meter's already set up, like in that in the in the the white. Uh, register that they flip around yeah. and stuff like that. So but I they, give them a they little usually bit. Now they, so the 18, 15% is gone. On those, when they flip the screen around, I'm like, yeah. I'm trying to swipe to, yeah. hey, where's the other buttons? Because it starts at 20%, yeah. and it's like 25%, and then 30% tip. So th the tips are going up, and, and well, that's just there in in the place. What if you go have Uber Eats yeah. or this other yeah. thing? It's like, hey, yeah, it's a, the tip. You want to tip the guy? You got the service fee. Yeah. You got the restaurant fee. Thirty dollars for this pizza I paid the other day. Yeah, yeah. I, I got one amendment. So, so one thing <coughs> I ask oh, is yeah. for everybody to do. Yes, the tips thing, and, and that's a, that's a really good point because people are struggling right now. Is I go to a, a small supermarket and they hire people with all sorts of uh, handicaps that mm -hmm. work the front and they do the bagging. Yeah, those motherfuckers always get tips. I bring, yeah. I make sure I bring singles to help those kids because when you give a kid like that a job, or some of them are adults, you give them a job. They're working. They're doing yeah. their thing. It gives them dignity. It's such a beautiful thing to mm -hmm. see. You know, if you want good karma, you go and you do bad things in your life, just at least give those kids yeah. a, at the front that do the bagging. Yeah. Uh, man, that's that's a really good thing to do. Yeah. Because no, the most important thing in life is give a human being dignity. And those kids, man, th their lives are tough enough as is. Yeah, I don't go, I don't, for tips, I don't go below 20. I mean, you, you got to be a big ass to get below 20%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If if you sucked and I still give you 20 just because of that, because of what you guys are saying that they're working. I got to tell my wife. She's like, no, "They're not going to get a tip." You know, that's But you know, it's, you, a, know you know it's crazy. The, I've, I've eaten recently with a few like large groups and they do the the pre-tip yeah. and they they did that when they brought you so sometimes nowadays they'll come to your table with a digital um you know the small portable like computer or, like an iPhone that you can pay right there in front of you. Um and one and it opened up and I wasn't even paying attention. It had the eighteen percent already in there, yeah. and then the original, like the thing that suggested, was another twenty five percent of your bill. So you know, where's this place at, dude? I, I forget what it is. I should right. I should call it out. What strip I, club I was this, Justin? <laughs> <laughs> strip club slash steakhouse. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm reformed. Yeah. Uh, but. No, it, I was like, I was mind blown because I recognized it way after the fact that I'd already signed and everything. Yeah. And I'm like, damn, yeah. that person. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was New Year's. I'll do it. I was New Year's Eve at the melting pot. Okay, it was an 18% like New Year's Eve working on New Year's Eve fee. Oh, so and you had to pay their overtime. 
Yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. And then I they suggested 25%. And I was like, oh, this is a nice night out. Boom. And I hit that. And then when I signed it, I, I looked at the And I'm like, oh, man. But I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to make that big deal. Whatever. It's New Year's Eve. I understand. Yeah. I used to work New Year's Eve a lot myself. But why? I don't like when they try to slide it in there. They don't right. say anything. Well, I got a Brooklyn move for you. This <laughs> you is go. an old <laughs> New York City, Brooklyn. Your, your, yeah. your uncle would know this movie. Yeah. We pre-tip. You sit down in a diner, oh. you sit down in a restaurant, you slide the guy, the busboy, a few dollars, great service. So, yeah. I mean, the tip after is great, but yeah. give the pre-tip so uh -huh. you get the great service and then slap something on at the end. You might have something there. Yeah, the pre-tip. Yeah. yeah, I did that the other day, the, the valet, and I was like, I'll get you when I, co when I come back. And he put me in the little, this tiny little spot, but I, I should have probably given the, the pre-tip. I, I got, I, I got, like I got advice. Do you cuff solve. it in your hand? Yeah, always cuff it. Even oh. the bad kids, I do. They like it. You know, I kind of like put the, the butt, like, hey, thank <laughs> you, take care. Of it. But, <laughs> but he's got the accent, and right? But, like that. That's it, it, the, that's the how you assume is, it. Listen, tips. The thing about the New York people is they gotta write us tips. Yeah. I'm gonna tell a quick story. I was in California staying with my brother. His car had a flat. He, hey, can you change the tire? Went to the tire place. It's like a five-hour wait. Then they're telling me, no, you know, California regulation, you can't do it. I walked up to the first mechanic with that 20 in my hand. Said, hey, bro, can you help me out? Boom. Yeah. It was done. So yes. <laughs> just walk around with a 20 when you need something done. Don't wait online. There you yeah. go. That's, that, that's, that's my, how you get stuff Money done. talks. It is. Right. My, my pops, it's capitalism, my friend. My yeah. pops is from the Bronx, and he does the same thing. It's capitalism. Yeah. He does the same. You call, walk out. Hey, how you doing? Boom. Right. Hey, hey, you, hey, hey how you doing? Can you <laughs> take care of me? Exactly. Hey, you know, and you get stuff done. Listen, these nobody's really making Unless a guy's, you know, making ridiculous money. Help people out. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Because yeah. the the valet, I feel bad sometimes because you don't, you don't know. Like I might be here a while, yeah. and they might do a shift change, and it's like, ah, I didn't get that guy on the. Can front I end. ask you guys though about valet? <laughs> okay, because I'm, I'm just not a valet guy. Yeah. Because yeah. I've seen. I remember when I was working as a cop, I've seen the stories of valet guys going through stuff, yeah. sexual stuff inside their cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, rubbers in the back seat. So Fr wait. I get nervous oh. about putting my car to a valet. <laughs> oh, yeah. like because it's like a hotel back there. Uh, I guess so. Hey, well, I can interject, and some of the audience members know I got yeah. a Tesla. So the, on Teslas, there's actual valet mode. Okay. You clip it over, and it locks your glove box. It locks everything. It it brings down your um your torque in the car, right. and it brings down the speed. Like it'll only let your car go 15 miles. But how an does hour. that stop them from banging in the back seat? <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. But then they haven't. I, I gotta get the software update for that one. <laughs> but there's, there is there is a camera on the inside, right above the rearview mirror. So he can make got, some money. You so got I can Bang make Brothers filming in your back seat. <laughs> I can make money on the back end eventually. <laughs> That's, oh my God. That's just capitalism. It's, it's, <laughs> it's all saved right there on the hard drive and locked inside the, uh, yeah, the right. area of the car. I'm not going to tell you where film. it's at. Sell yeah. It. So, <laughs> the valet stories. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, I never heard those stories before. But now that I heard them, I'll pay a little. I'm gonna look at the guy. Yeah, I get nervous. No the, funny business. I'm watching you, <laughs> you like it's like it's such a weird thing. You work your entire life to let's say buy a nice car, and you hand it over to an 18 year old kid who yeah. you don't never met. And you know this is your your pride and joy, your car, and and this kid can just go to town. Now I'm not just, I'm not bad talking valets. I'm sure well, there's some great ones out there. Matter of fact, we got to get a valet guy on and tell us some crazy <laughs> stories. <laughs> I know one. But uh, there you go. But. But it, I only valet when there's like not no options of parking. Like yeah. if you but, have to park or down let's the go block. Back to, let's go back to my other rule. Yeah, that twenty. That that twenty puts you right up front. I I, I park him. You no, know, not the valet kid. I park it myself, and that yeah. valet kid is like, "Thank you so much for helping me." Yeah. He gets that twenty, and <laughs> yeah, so I get got nobody. I get no rubbers in the back seat. <laughs> no, I can just see it now. I got Lambo, Ferrari, right. Toyota Highlander with a dent on the side. Right, right. No special <laughs> sauce on your seat. Yeah. Nothing. But he gave him a 20. Yeah. <laughs> he took care of it. Yeah. So, all right. So, look. There you go. We, we haven't even been on five minutes. We got already a couple tips from you. Get a 20. <laughs> carry a 20 around. Always. Wherever you're at. Right. 20 out of bill. Because what, what does that 20 do for you? It, it saves time. Yeah. It's, it's really about your paying for your time. That $20, you just saved yourself 40 minutes of aggravation, fighting, why can't you change my tire, fighting, why can't I just park in front? That mm -hmm. 20 saves everything. Mm. It's good for your health. That's a good way to think about it. It's good for it. the economy. It's good for the kid. It's good for everybody. <laughs> it's a salesman. Yeah. That 20 is good for everybody. It's you know what? Everything. I'm going to go I'm gonna go to the ATM after this. It's trickle get down it, theory, right? Digital age. I'm just going to say, what's your, down. Hey, what's your Venmo? And that, kid, your... that kid with that $20 bill, he's going to go right buy that apparel from you. Go yeah. right to your merch store. That's right. Yeah. Man, I got to do him cash app then so you get a digital currency. Yeah. We got to step our game up with the cash app. You know, you should just run around with your uh, Nick Off Duty shirts and just, hey, man. Can I park up front? Here you go. Here's a Nick <laughs> Off Duty shirt. <laughs> I don't know about that. Because then they're going to Signed. Yeah. Signed. 
<laughs> Signed, it's more value. Hey, you want to take a picture with me? <laughs> I don't want to tell you what they're going to do with that shirt in the backseat of my car because <laughs> we're trying to keep it. <laughs> we're, we seem like we're trending, trending that way, but I'm trying to keep it back that way. We go, oh, thanks for the shirt, buddy. <laughs> I find that in the back seat of my car, along with the other items that you. Oh said. yeah, yeah, nice steaming. <laughs> you know what? All right, let's bring it back. So ten percent, ten percent, ten percent, ten percent. All right, and so a cup of coffee, you're ninety cents for the coffee. You leave in nine cents. You cheap no, bastard. No, you gotta leave singles. No, if not, <laughs> you leave yeah, the dollar. Uh, Listen, that's why you walk around with singles. Singles. Right. Take there, I have there, zero cash on me. There's another thing. Sometimes. You have cash? Uh, That's it's usually thing. a little bit like walking around money is what I call it. Like if you get kicked yeah. out of a car, you got enough to get you get yeah. you home or whatever. Yeah. Nowadays it's digital. The old lady times, kicks you out of the house. Exactly you're ready that. to yeah. You get got your throw down bag. And, yeah, you, you know. got walking cash. But uh, but you know, and then the other thing is, is like for for the cops out there, sometimes you're you're forced to take some sort of a discount from a restaurant or whatever, I always make sure to then kind of throw it back. Oh, I throw a, it back at them. That's a good a one. We good do point. have a lot of police listeners. So you get the the old, we took care of you at the on the bill. What do you do then? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, well, oh. you always tip on pre, yeah, pre-discount. Exactly. Don't yeah. be an animal. Yeah. Be, be, a, be a good <laughs> yeah, guy. Yeah, that's yeah. a good... Don't that's, be an animal. Don't be an animal. Don't be, be an animal and glom all the food because you're a cop and then not yeah. take care of these kids. Yeah. Don't a, be an animal. That's a thing too. I don't... You know... Unfortunately, this is the life that we live. Sometimes we, we walk into a shop and they're like, no, 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 go ahead and take the water or take the Gatorade. And, and then you have people that abuse that and they'll go back to that shop and they're there on break every every day, three times a day, walking 100%. in, just taking their stuff. And uh, and it doesn't I'm not saying I've seen it personally in my department. I want to put that out there. But it does happen. I know of. I've seen it personally. <laughs> yeah. I'll throw you retired. I'll throw these motherfuckers right under the bus because it's not cool. Listen, yeah. I mean, nah. there's a small business owner yeah. who's trying to make his money. He loves to have cops. It makes him feel a little safer. Yeah. And you're going to take advantage and eat three Subway sandwiches a day there and not leave a big tip? Yeah. Come on, yeah, yeah. man. Absolutely. Yeah. Be a gentleman. Don't be an animal. Don't be an animal. Mm-hmm. There it is. So, no, I, I agree on that. Is uh, I'm always uh, tipping off of the original mm-hmm. and, and making up. For the bill, I almost make. I almost pay the whole thing, anyways. I'm just like, right, yeah, right. here's a big tip, and uh, yeah, yeah, have a good day. You oh. want to? Uh, we What's we that? have hit. We have a break. The first 15 minute timer. Oh. So you know we can we okay. can give them a timer. We're gonna we're gonna take a quick break, anyways. I got a phone call from our next guest, and right. um, we'll be right back. Be right back. Real quick, wanted to talk to you about Battle Warrior Coffee. Uh, I know the owners uh, personally. They're fellow law enforcement officers. I told them that I would shout them out. I've had their coffee. It is delicious. So uh, it's a veteran-owned, law enforcement-operated company originated out of Miami, Florida. It started by three Army veterans turned police officers who say coffee got them through many difficult times through their career and still does today. Their goal is to get every warrior to overcome their personal battles one cup of coffee at a time. Visit their website at BattleWarriorCoffee.com or follow them on IG at Battle Warrior Coffee. Again, at Battle Warrior Coffee. Use the code DONUT and get 15% off your first order. Or you can visit them at FedsApparel.com. They're under veteran-owned companies and Leo-owned companies. There's also a discount code there for 15% off by using DONUT. DONUT gets you 15% off. Just put DONUT everywhere you go and you get 15% off of this coffee. All right, let's get back to the show. All right, so yeah, we took we took a little stretch time. Stretch time. Why are we taking stretch time? Because our guest has a bad back. What happened, man? Uh, you know, uh, accumulation of, of stuff at work, uh, the vest, obviously, the belt, kind of compressed my spine, and then I was in two pretty bad accidents at work. So I ended up getting two back operations, and um, I, I was just telling Justin on the break that, man, never get back surgery. It, it, is, it, it, it made me so much worse. Uh, the first one, I thought I had a little bit of positive then the second one was supposed to help get rid of my sciatica doc said ah the second one's nothing and I went to the top guy in the world uh really bad and I remember I posted some stuff on social media talking about you know the bad experience I had with the back surgery and you just get a million people with the same story you know back surgery killed me back surgery killed me so I'm not a doctor I'm not saying if they're saying you're going to lose your leg get the back surgery I'm just saying I mean for years, make sure you do your, your physical therapy, make sure you drop the weight, make sure you do everything in your power. Because, you know, thinking there's some magic, there's, there is that one, one or two guy story you'll hear every once in a while, ah, my back was killing me, I had surgery, I'm great. 
Yeah, he, he's very rare. Yeah, those are specific it's, cases. Yeah. And in mine, I had a he had, um, bad, he had bad back problems as well. Super, super bad. You know, and, and of late, like went to the hospital, and then your yeah. you know steroid thing yeah. and all that, and and it was bad. And so I've always done like maintenance, where I would go to like stretch zone, and I always get massages, and I and I try to stretch regularly and stuff, and it and it mitigated some of the problems. But you know, they're, they're some of the only days I've ever called out of work were just because you couldn't sit in the car, yeah. and and you're just like I'm no good. To anybody with you know my hips all jacked up and everything so mine was lower back but so I started working out just over a year ago because I didn't really work out that much I you know I was like ah you know I'll be all right I'll be all right so I started working out and recognized how bad the back was and my trainer and everything started gearing things towards that and nowadays like knock on wood it's it's really nice to be able to wake up and not be like oh oh, oh." so it, it sometimes it'll get a little cold on the back just if i'm sitting weird but for the most part like you know i I appreciate the uh the workout so like you said drop the weight hit hit the gym do it the right way do it appropriately and stuff don't screw yourself up in the gym but uh and and strengthen up that core because that's a lot of things as as cops with the with the belt with the vest and everything like that there is that compression stuff so so take care of your bodies how many years did you do and did it did the career end because of the back yeah they they, they retired well i had uh, seven shoulder operations too i just had my my seventh um uh, was that yeah, from the accident, from a car accident, you said? Yeah, I had some car accidents that kind of hurt my back. And I, there was actually the last straw on my back was during an active shoot of training. It was oh. actually strange that, you know, that's something that we train. That's something that's, you know, we now know how, how important it is. Yeah. And, and we had a scenario, not only do we go into a mall where there's an active shooter and we're dressing, which is, once again, incredible and critical to, to get that training. But I don't know. Someone came up with the idea, well, what if a cop goes down, somebody scoop him up and carry him yeah, out? Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if that was really necessary. If one of my friends went down, or an elephant went down, my adrenaline, I would drag him out. Yeah. To have to physically do it, scoop somebody off off the ground, that just, from my back, was the last straw. So. Well, and then you're a tall guy, so you've got yeah, a, you've so got distance to cover to bend down to grab somebody. Yeah, so, you know, that's something... I don't think it was necessary, but all right, it, it is what it is. Yeah, we it, and that's that's one of the problems with with the the push for training and police reform and all that stuff like that. It happens sometimes too, where in training we get hurt. You know, like because a lot of times. because a lot of time, like you said, you don't have a little bit of that shield called adrenaline yeah. that you're dealing with that your body just miraculously protects itself yeah. you know in a training you might be at a lower a cooler level and and you end up hurting yourself so you got to take training seriously so too. you got hurt in training and then you went out uh with disability with disability with yeah. disability yeah. so all right so you said but you've done how many years did you do over there? 19 years 19 well, years. I, first i started out the town of surfside mm. uh huh. did, did a year in surfside you know people didn't the other thing when you saw the the tiktok thing with miami cop if I tell people I'm an Aventura cop, they, yeah. they have no idea where that is. So cool. I, I would write it on there. Same thing. So now Surfside obviously is on the map for that unfortunate uh, yeah. building collapse. Yeah. I started there, and then I, I wanted a bigger department, a little bit more challenges. Because they I, have, like today, like around 30-ish people. Yeah, I it was think. back yeah, then. Yeah. yeah, it was pretty pretty limited. We actually worked out of a trailer. We, oh, we wow. didn't even have a the police station. There was a trailer, and you'd handcuff people to furniture. <laughs> that, that was our holding cell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was different times. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you went to Aventura? And then you you did your career there. Yeah, then, then I did another eighteen years. What'd you do over there? Uh, road did patrol, so I road patrol. Did some detective work. Uh, worked a homicide. Unfortunately, it's the only one homicide. One of the I wasn't the lead. One of the homicides I worked was the only one that still today is unsolved. Oh I God. know they keep putting out the information every few years trying to track this guy down. Uh, did did some of the plain clothes work. Worked for some of the units. I'm trying to think of the names of the plain clothes units, but we'd go into some of the neighborhoods picking up people with warrants, Opalaka and Liberty City. Oh, so and you're like on a task force. Task force. Going, I'm yeah. trying to think. I can't even remember the names of it. They always had those names. You're not the first to do that, but the whole Miami um, name, like Miami Cop, because really, you don't, if you're not from South Florida, you don't understand how many different agencies we have. Yeah. Can, do you know off the top? No, like, no idea. There's a lot. Yeah. Because uh, it would be like a borough in New York. So a new NYPD is NYPD, but they have the different boroughs the different precincts over here those each borough each little area is its own pd <clears throat> and sometimes you can there's like a mile long and there's another pd so uh metro dade county 
police department. You know Metro Dade. Miami they, Dade. Miami Dade. No. They used to be well, Metro, yeah, used to be used to Metro, Metro yeah. Dade. The reason why they changed, no one knows what for Metro the, Dade is. Yeah. yeah so now the, they're Miami Dade Police. Name so. right. Yeah, because it's just a larger geographical name. Yeah. Miami, awesome. you know, I, I think the craziest thing down here for people from around the country that listen to this podcast is we're the only, I think we're the only uh, area that uses Q codes. It's, yeah. It's a different way of talking on the radio. So here I'm working in a city in Aventura and we border Broward County. Yeah. And if we do a chase, you know, on the radio, we have to start talking just like we're talking now, regular. Yeah. We cannot yeah. use any of our codes. Clean we, talk. Yeah, we use a, a different code because everyone talks about like 10-4 and 10 this. And I don't know what the hell they're saying. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. that was that's interesting because if you're not familiar, we um, the, the, the county of Dade uses Q codes. You guys were right on the border, meaning on one side of the street is Broward County, yeah. a whole other county, which uses 10 codes, and pretty much the rest of the nation uses 10 codes. Right. Tens so and I guess signals. America started right there on that line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. At Hallandale Beach. At yeah. Hallandale Beach. Yeah. America started right there. I always thought that you would know the both, that Q and 10, because you're right there on the line. You know who knows both? The troopers. Yeah. They know the Q codes and the 10 codes. Yeah. They're just better than you. But yeah, no, yeah. but that's Trooper. <laughs> yeah. Listen, you're you, out there. Listen, Trooper, you're out there by yourself. That's a different, different job. There is yeah. no backup when you're a Trooper. Yeah. You know, you're an Aventur, you're in City of Miami. Yeah. You know, two or three, five minutes, other agencies, everybody's there. Trooper, yeah, show me out in the woods fighting an alligator, yeah. you know, in, <laughs> yeah. in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And, and, you know, your backup's 20 minutes away. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're definitely a different breed, and, and rightfully so because of that situation. Yeah. Whereas when you're working in a large city, there's always somebody around. But uh, I just thought that it was – so you did 19 years, yeah. and you didn't pick up one 10 code. You are that person <laughs> yeah, I that uh, – I live in America. Like, yeah. okay, how long have you been here? All my life. Yeah, and yeah. you don't know uh, English? Uh, no. no, sorry. No, no I know you cure <laughs> sanguish. Yeah. Yeah. I love you, baby. Yeah, that's no. it. Uh, but I bet you know some Spanish. Yeah, I do. All I, right. I, that, yeah, the funny – that's another funny story yeah. is – I remember growing up in the New York City uh, Board of Education, and they were teaching, and we had a Spanish class. And I look at my buddies in, in school, and I'm like, when in my fucking life am I ever going to need to speak Spanish? I yeah. come to Miami, <laughs> welcome to Calle Ocho. I'm like, what is a Calle Ocho? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's... it's, it's yeah. Listen, as a police officer, like we're talking about the 10 codes, Yeah. honestly, I think even knowing Spanish for where you work or whatever the dialect is more, even more, you want to go into a house and they're talking in another language, you don't know what they're saying. Yeah. So, you know, you want to survive, you better learn what they're saying. Did you have to, so when we went to the academy uh, and we got out, there was like a little ceremony. We had to name our firearms, our guns. Everyone had to pick, pick a name yeah. for their gun. That sounds really cool. Yeah? <laughs> no. Why? No, we I don't know. Go, I, go ahead. You know, so. they would name them like, you know, car names. Like, this is yeah. Susie. And, Betsy. You know, yeah. yeah. I named mine the translator. Yeah. Because no matter what language, if, if it was time to pull it out, you understood like, okay, yeah. this is serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, So yeah, I yeah. called it the translator. Okay. Yeah. All right. Hey, that's, that's I'm that's just a saying. Nice thing to do. It's a good name. Yeah. That's what's a better it? name. <laughs> what's wrong with that? That's yeah. a better name. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 you want to talk about training? I'm going to throw in a quick story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was doing a training when I was working for a plain clothes unit. I was doing a training somewhere in Hialeah, but really out west, like just in the middle of nowhere. And for the people who don't know Hialeah, it's it's um, it's on the western part of Miami, and um, we were in a really rural area. So uh, it's an undercover class, and there's maybe ten of us in that class. And there's a room off to the side, and it sounds like somebody's doing defensive tactics (DT), and we just hear. Things being thrown against the wall, a lot of screaming, yelling, like, like somebody's in a lot of pain, but I don't know anything about it. <laughs> no, nobody knows what's going on. You know, who cares? I don't yeah, want to know. I think about know. cops. We don't want to know. I, I don't know I'm, I'm there, you know, do my thing. And so, so I don't, I don't, that's none of my business. So at some, at some point in the, in the training, I get up to go to the bathroom. And uh, there's a little bathroom in this place. I get up to go to the bathroom, and I'm standing in a urinal doing my thing. And I just feel a presence and a shadow coming towards me. You just can feel it. So as I'm zipping up, and thank God I'm putting everything away, as I'm zipping up, this seven-foot guy comes walking in. It's Shaq. Shaquille oh, O'Neal was there, there doing he – was, he was training to be a Miami Beach officer. I guess he was doing his defensive tactics. Whoa. So here comes Shaq coming right up to the urinal. I'm like, thank God I'm not standing next to the urinal next to Shaq. <laughs> how's it going? How's it going? Right. right so, <laughs> how's, it so, going, how's it going, little man? Yeah, so that's all right. That's, so, yeah. You think that's what I want to be standing next to? <laughs> yeah. So that was the first time I met Shaq was, was in the toilet, you know, in a oh, men's wow. room. That's awesome. Did you say anything to him? No, he, he was – 
nicest guy in the world. Nicest, hey brother, hey brother, you know that yeah, voice. Hey, hey, how's it going? How's it going? Yeah, how you doing, brother? Yeah. Anyway, you know, and then the, there's a guy code thing in the bathroom. We don't make too much eye contact yeah. and touch each other. Yeah. <laughs> so wow, I did true. run into him. It's funny thing is, I ran into him uh, maybe a year or two later in a nightclub, and he must have definitely thought I was somebody else because he came over to me and he was like, "Hey, nice to see you, a long time." And of course, there was. But once again, the, the point is. What a hell of a nice guy! You know yeah. that, that's that's a guy you root for. Somebody like that. So you didn't exchange numbers so I can mm. call him and get him on this show. He's been mm. dying to get Shaq on the podcast. Yeah, I mean, I just all I can tell you is just the the nicest human being on earth. So he's, you didn't get his number. The guy was in a urinal with him. Yeah. Isn't that a, just how many sh- numbers do you ask for yeah, at the urinal? All the time. Right. All I, the time. I'm just saying. I don't know. Right. I don't know about this guy. But, a little funny business going on over here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, he'd he'd be super cool because he's you know like yes. he said training to be a Miami Beach cop. Yeah, or whatever you know. That's what I do with a lot of defensive tactics. <laughs> yeah, could you imagine <laughs> the guy underneath the rim? Could you imagine doing the defensive tactics yeah. with Shaq? Yeah, who's, yeah, who's throwing him down? I don't who's, know, man. There was probably four or five dead people. We had a guy, and I can't. I'm not going to put him out there. It's not at the uh, the current academy. I did my academy in another place. He was a defensive defensive tactics guy, but he was um, he had just crossed over from corrections. He felt I, I felt like he had a chip on his shoulder because he always wanted to be a cop. He got into a smaller agency, and um, he was just like, uh, I'm a cop, you know? Mm-hmm. So when he would teach us defensive tactics move, it was like 100%. It's like, okay, uh, you, you're going to be my volunteer. So oh, like no. hip tosses were real hip tosses, and he'd be like, yeah. And he'd get up. You see, that's how you do it. I was like, <laughs> so talking about the Shaq guy, you know, dealing with Shaq, this guy was a nightmare to deal with. He wow. actually hurt somebody's shoulder in the in the academies, and he was the instructor. <laughs> so, uh, just I uh, just brought me that's, to the story no, that, with the that, shack stuff. That's actually kind of common with, with yeah. guys who are a little bit insecure that want to prove that go a little aggressive. Last thing you should ever get. I mean, it's possible for a freak, but you shouldn't be really getting hurt in training. No, you know, I always thought it was it was stupid that if I got hurt in training and somebody's calling for. I don't want to say the code, but calling for an emergency police backup. Yeah. I want to be there 100%, so I bring, you know, bring myself 100%. Uh, there, there was a story. Was he a little older guy, that guy? No. Was but, a smaller, little older guy? No, but he, that guy was good, too. Um, I know who you're talking about. He was in my, he did my there uh, was instructor. A, when, when I was, this was maybe 12 years ago, there was a, an older, older dude who in his day must have been a badass, badass. But yeah. he was... Man, he was must have been close to seventy years old when he came in to do a little bit of training in our roll call area. I don't know why this was occurring. That's not where we do our DT. But oh, it had to do with bringing guns into court back then. Something about that. That back in the day we used to not. And so he was doing a gun retention class. So the story is, you could see at some point in time he was a badass, but he was way past his prime. Yeah. And all of us in our department were giving him his props because, yeah. you know, the guy did his time and everything. So when he would twist your arm, you'd go, ow, and you'd tap and yeah. everything. But we had that one guy that just wouldn't play along. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he just said, ah, oh, your stuff ain't going to work on me. And you can. And the old guy just wanted to go home that day. Shows, I still got it. You know, yeah, I yeah. twisted this guy's arm and he screamed. And yeah. we all screamed for the old guy to yeah. give him his props. Yeah. Except for this one dude. So so the old guy's like, well, you know, if I got your back, what would you do? So he jumps on the guy's back, the officer's back. And this officer is just not right in the head. He's got <laughs> the old man on his back. He's got the old man on his back because he's a little guy. And he's got yeah. the old man on his back just like Yoda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what his move is, this officer's move is, in a roll call room, it's not a DT, there's no padding. Yeah. Runs backwards as hard <laughs> as he can because I guess his idea is he's going to smash him up against the wall. But... He doesn't make it to the wall. They kind of trip. The old guy goes flying, bangs his head off a desk. And we're like, oh, my God. And thank God, like, two people had to carry the old guy back to his car. All he wanted to do was go home that night and tell his wife, I still got it. Oh, my God. But, you know, you got to be careful because some people are... (laughs) <laughs> so he almost killed that. So what would thing. you do? <laughs> right, that's that's what it was. Oh, you can't do it to me. I'm oh, like, just yeah. just be nice to the older guy. Yeah. Show him respect. Oh my yeah. god, that is hilarious. Right. What so happened he, to the guy? What happened to the guy? You get in the trouble? old guy? No, no he didn't. Guy. No, he didn't get in trouble. But yeah. you know, it was we were all you know all in, in shock. You know, because yeah. it was if he would have hit his head on that desk just to drop, he would have been dead. Oh, you know, and then try to explain oh, that you got to do that you report. Imagine if he oh you my killed, god, you, dude. the guy's probably a hero to cops who yeah. you know, he, he went through in his time. Yeah, he was way past his prime. He was just trying to oh, hold on to pass it. on some knowledge. Right at the same time, you got to know when to hang it. Up. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. You gotta, yeah. If I'm older, and I'm jumping on some guy's back. Maybe I deserve a little bit of right. Know. Okay, you okay. know what I mean. Well, yeah, I mean it could be, but you know, yeah. Well, th- so. 
as you were telling your story, I remember what happened to the guy. He ended up getting fired from his agency because he, he uh, 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 use of force. He went, what is it called? Abuse of power? Or yeah. Excessive force. There it is. Mm-hmm. He, he uh, got in trouble for excessive force on a, on a subject. So oh. he ended up. So the guy used to beat everybody up in the DT. Yeah, that's it. Just went out. To it the was street. just his thing. Man. If he's beating us up, what's he doing out there? So right. he got in trouble for that. And Ooh, he got fired. Right, but what 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 was it about his personality? What insecurity was it about it that he had to imply to show people how tough he is? I think it was that's a, the worst kind of cop. I think it was. Uh, so the, what the way I dissected it, it was that he was corrections. And that he wanted to be a police officer, and maybe he saw the police officer's training. He's like, I'm better than you guys. And then eventually he got hired, but he was a DT instructor from Corrections, and eventually got hired from a PD, actually during the academy that I was in. So he just started his career in police. But you could tell there was a chip on that his chip, shoulder. That's the worst. Listen, that is the worst thing to have as a cop. The chip on the shoulder. The guy who has to prove. The guy who was you know, called this and that his whole life. Now he's going to show he's tough. Yeah. That's not the right type of cop. This nope. is a job. You need to be humble. This is a job. You need to have security. Mm-hmm. You feel secure about yeah. yourself. I've always said that you know something really good for police work which has nothing to do with what you should be doing is boxing. And I'll tell you why. One, it's good to learn defensive, but not that you're going to use offensive boxing in any police, but it just makes you humble. When you get punched in the face, yeah. you're not a god, you're not a this, you're not yeah. a tough guy, you're humble again. So I always thought boxing was a great thing for police officers to blow off some steam, plus also say, hey, I'm not the toughest guy in the world. I get punched in the face too. Yeah. And I think it's really, really important, you know, that, that type of personality of somebody who doesn't need to you know, show their power to make up for some sort of insecurity. So, and I would say nowadays, um, jujitsu is huge because there's officers that maybe they get punched in the face and then they fall to their back and then they have somebody coming on top of them. Now you're like, oh my God, I'm in fear for my life. I'm on my back. I got to take out my gun and shoot this person. Whereas somebody who's trained where they start in the position of on their back, they're like, ah, I'm at home here. Let me just take his arm here, move him, lock him here, roll him over, and now I'm on top, and I'm in the full mount position. So yeah. I think jujitsu, boxing, anything to let off that steam to where you get punched in the face, because a lot of people put on that badge and they're like, ah, this is I'm I'm indestructible. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, 100%. until you get until you get punched in the face. Right. You know, I had this move uh, as a police officer that was like I was 100 percent at being able to take down the subject until there was that one day where I tried that move, and I was like, uh-uh, it didn't work. It was just a baker that was, uh, somebody that was uh, having an episode, and they were just, you know, when they, and they're just cemented. Crazy in the, strength, yeah. yeah. Superhuman not strength. Not going to feel pain. They're not yeah. Gonna... So, as, you know, the, where you go under the chin, you throw them off balance, and you yeah. sweep the leg, and you bring them down. That was, like, my go-to, 100%. Yeah. And so I got, then I was like, okay. I need more guys. I need more people to help Back me out up. here. Yeah, let's figure yeah. this out. Speaking of jujitsu, I would say if you're a trooper, that is the number one thing. Oh, yeah. Th- when you're alone, you know, when you might have to fight for 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Th- you know, the thing is, like, for a city guy, I would say ch- try to stay on your feet as, as, as long as you can because you're hitting your – we have a little red button on yeah. our radios. You hit your little emergency button. Just try to hold off the subject if you're in that fight for your life as best as you can. You know, the thing that always amazed me about police work is women, and I'll tell you why. Because for a woman, how brave they have to be. For a woman to be in a fight with the average size guy is like, I'm, I'm 6'3". You That's like Shaq. me fighting it's Shaq. Like, yeah, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. It's like... It's so, me again. So I don't want to fight Shaq. Yeah. So think about like how brave women have to be. Because I've been in fights where I've seen a couple of guys not jump in and I've had 90-pound women jump in. Now they got their asses kicked, they got thrown, but it's about the heart. It's yep. not yeah, about... Yeah. The ju- this job is always about the heart of a human being. It's never about their f- what they look like, what they say. It's w- what's in their heart. Which brings us back to the reason why you're here today. You like that? That's a yeah. nice transition. You like brother. that transition? That, I, man, I felt smooth. Yeah. <laughs> man, I felt like you took me to the ground. And then cut it off and take a break. <laughs> well, well, when we come back, we're going to talk about a guy with a big heart who was four foot nine in records, but in actuality, we have some evidence now that says otherwise. Uh, When we come back, we're going to hear the story of Richard Flaherty. Flaherty. There it is. I said it without your help. You're just nodding like you're doing good. If you could, you'd pat me on the head. (laughs) (laughs) So we'll take a quick break, and we'll come right back, and we're going to dive right into it. 
this season, we're going to be recording out of our new studio, the Donut Shop Podcast Studio, located in Feds Apparel. We teamed up with Feds this year. You're going to hear more about it throughout the entire season. And if you want to, go visit them right now at FedsApparel.com. You could even pick up one of my cool police car shirts, shameless plug. Uh, go over there, FedsApparel.com, and check out everything they have to offer. Now, let's get to the podcast. All right. <laughs> All right so, four foot nine, Richard Flaherty. So this story, Talk to me. Talk this to me. story starts when I go to this new city from Surfside. I transfer over to Aventura. That's really where the story starts as a rookie cop. And uh, as every rookie cop knows, you, you, you need money. So you're working off-duty jobs yeah. nonstop. So I was working off-duty job at the movie theater in uniform. And this tiny little dude would come in. And, uh, you know, just like you just see somebody over and over. And that's how relationships start. You don't. Just go approach people you don't know, a head nod, or this or that. There was something different about this guy besides the fact that he was tiny. He was four foot nine. He also was uh, athletic build, built. You know, so you have in, in real life you have dwarfism, you have proportionate dwarfism, and you have non-proportionate. You think of like a Peter Dinklage. Yeah, my friend would be considered proportionate dwarf. Uh, all his limbs are, are, are the exact size of ours, just just shrunk. So. Um, See him every day, sort of the nods, and I started asking him because he was always in the movies. So I'd ask him about the movie he just saw, and that's kind of how a relationship started. Something happened. He would come into the mall. Something happened in the mall. They felt that he was homeless or that he was spending so much time. They kicked him out. Uh, I know he fought his way back into the mall legally. And then uh, I would see him out on the streets, and we would talk more and more. And this guy, this little homeless guy, and when I say homeless, he wasn't dirty, dirty or anything. He took care of himself and his appearance. This little guy had such knowledge about the world. Now, the other thing I want to stop and say is I try getting him off the streets. You know, I try to say, hey, you know, we have shelters. Hey, I have these programs. I have this. What can I do to help you get off the streets? But as you mentioned, you said the word baker, and f cops know what that means in Florida. For the rest of us, you know, it's a mental illness where – a bake rack means that the person is a danger to themselves or to others, and if we left them alone untreated, you know, it would cause harm to themselves. My little guy never met that criteria that you know, I could force him into my hospital or into uh, some type of uh, uh, doctor's care. So we just stayed friends, and I kind of had that, you, know, you just kind of get that feeling um, that the guy doesn't want you to peer too much into his past, and I didn't. So we would just talk about politics and laugh a lot. So let's fast forward 15 years of this friendship, of just meeting for coffee, having a sandwich, and he looks me in the eye one day, and he says, Dave, i got to tell you who I really am. So as cops, yeah. you know, we're, we're, we're a skeptical bunch, so I'm like, all right, here he is. He's going to tell me he's wanted here. I killed these people, and you yeah. know, I'm yeah. about to turn myself in. I don't know what he's going to say, but I'm super nervous because I really did enjoy talking to the guy. I really thought uh, he had a lot of interesting f philosophical ideas that he would actually you know, constantly – prep me and test me. So here's a homeless guy kind of teaching me. Yeah. And that's the, the other thing about being humble is everyone on this earth can teach you something. So yeah. I was picking up stuff from him and learning stuff from him. So what does he say? He says, Dave, I was the smallest man to ever serve in the U.S. military, and my mind's like, impossible. There's no such thing as four foot nine uh, military people. But he keeps going. He goes, yeah, I, I served over in Vietnam with the 101st Airborne, and then after my first tour, I went uh Back to uh, special forces school, became a green beret. I was like, a green beret. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's like now the story is getting even crazier. And then after I started working undercover operations with the ATF, and I don't want you to look into those things because, you know, those things, some of those things are so classified. And then I did some private military contract work. I did some private military contract for the CIA. And I'm like, he's got his story down. And I love my friend, but man, he's, he's for obviously much more delusional than I can possibly believe. Were you were you breaking his balls because no no, I, no? I, I was just you know listen you know because this is a person I, I really you know you know I just respected, imagine you, respected, you yeah. here's the thing is that you you were, were we've been friends for uh, fifteen days right. and and you're already a so I can imagine right the you, difference the, the difference with this is this you know you're dealing with somebody who's maybe mentally ill delusional and uh, you know you just feel bad about breaking that bubble yeah. you know that, I just think it was f for fifteen years maybe you guys had a, a good relationship we did but. When he starts telling me this information, I'm yeah. getting nervous that yeah. maybe he wasn't really, you know, as mentally stable as I thought. Okay. Because okay. it's just so, yeah, it's yeah. so far fetched. So, yeah, yeah so the guy saw he's this telling, in a movie and right, just he's created me a, a super, He's telling me the Captain America story. He's yeah. Yeah. Basically, he's telling me he's Captain America. So, <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, I just left that, you know, with a real shaken feeling of feeling bad because 
you know, it's like now from now on, I kind of look at him as somebody really much more damaged than I initially thought. Yeah. So I go home that night and, and I'm taking off my uniform and I'm not even going to think, but whatever, let me check on the, you know, Google, who is the smallest guy? And all of a sudden these old newspaper articles, smallest man wants to join the military, smallest man wants to become a Green Beret, and it's him. Oh my so God. So I'm like, yeah. holy shit, yeah. the most interesting human being on the face of the earth, the most remarkable, the most incredible, has been living here in Aventura on the streets and he slept under a tree. And a million people every day would pass him by and not even give him a look. And this is the most interesting man in the entire earth. Yeah. So I ran back to him the next day and he looked at my face. He goes, hey, you didn't believe me. I knew it when I was telling you the story. <laughs> now you believe me. So I was like, yeah. And he goes, look. I said, Rich, why would you tell me? He goes, look, you know, I feel like my life is a cautionary tale of what went wrong when I got out of the military in Vietnam and how I eventually became homeless. And somehow he goes, Dave, somehow I want you to tell my story. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I mean, you know, eventually I'll just collect his information and I'll just, you know, try to find a real filmmaker, a real writer to take over this thing. And, you know, for the next two years, I'll interview Richard. That's the mistake we all make. That yeah. we think we have time, time with mm -hmm. people and mm -hmm. you just never know. So 10 days after he made this incredible revelation, he gets killed in a really bizarre hit and run. And we could jump into the hit and run you know, a little bit later, and I have no problem talking about it. I usually don't promote it because it's just it's just such an ugly, negative thing, but we can certainly talk about it as cops, uh, especially since the suspect worked for Miami-Dade Homicide Unit yeah. as a civilian employee. Um, so, you know, so that was kind of the initial plan. He gets killed in this hit and run, and I'm like, well, that's over. I mean, uh, how much information do I have about this guy? I just have some... Notes, I only had two minutes of video that one day I used my phone to videotape him. How am I going to – I made a promise to the man that I'll get a story out to the world. Yeah. How am I going to honor this promise? And I was like – there was times I was just like, well, it's just not going to happen. But um, he had a storage unit. I was the only one who knew he had a storage unit because when he got killed, there was a day and a half that it was an open homicide. You know, it was an open traffic homicide. So I told my guys, hey, I know he's got a unit. You know, he told me about a unit where he keeps keep stuff. So we went over there, and that's where we kind of started our investigation. And inside that unit was almost like breadcrumbs of his whole life. There was the documentation from the beginning of his life to the end. It was all over the place. It wasn't organized. It took me a long time. And there was just amazing and shocking things I found there. And I'll go into Somebody remind me about the shocking stuff. Okay. So that's kind of just how the, this whole project got started of me. You know, I spent the next uh, five years. I mean, even till today, I'm still chasing down this trail because all of Richard's story will never be told because he took some stuff to the grave with him. Yeah. But it is just... It is just the most bizarre, remarkable, the most inspiring, the most tragic, the most the highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows. So it took you five years to put all this stuff together. The, yeah, that's and and I, what I did is I originally, initially I released the documentary thinking, okay, I'm done. I made my promise to the man. Yeah, I told his story. So what happens People in the documentary? It. There were some missing pieces. Yeah, that I speculated, but I wasn't 100 percent sure. And I wanted that that documentary to be a thousand percent black and white as a cop. If you can't prove it, then it's not real. Yeah. So, so the, the, it's really black and white, but there's missing holes in the story uh, of the documentary. After the documentary, and I opened up a social media page for him to help promote, like on Facebook, uh, The Giant Killer. Um, and, and the name The Giant Killer, if people want to know, that was his nickname in high school. Yeah. That, that he was given, and it's in his yearbook, and that had to do with something about, as a freshman, he got into a fight with a bully and, and blew the guy's knee out. Yeah. And he, he was a tough little dude. Yeah. So, so that's how David we got Goliath. the name. I, I yeah. didn't come up with the name The Giant Killer. So um, after the documentary, so many people reached out from around the world, and a lot of them were just kooks, and I had to vet them. And some of them just said, hey, I was with him in Venezuela. Hey, I was with him in Iraq when he did this mission. I was with And that's when I said, okay, now i got to write the book. So, you know, it's it's like that never-ending story. Yeah. That, this guy. So you're gonna write a book about it. So I have the book. Of... I have the book about Richard Flaherty now. It, so it, it's done. Okay. So that's the book you have. You have yeah. Prop. So that's the missing. The, the the gray the gray area is now black and white in that book. Boom. Yes. Yes. There it for, is. But not. For, let's, for let's go. camera B. <laughs> right. For <laughs> camera B. But let's not. There's still things in his life that even I haven't un uncovered yet. Uh -huh. There's still classified things. There's so there's so many layers to his story, and part of it was 
him. He would set up little traps. He put out false information. He was really the most complex human being I've ever heard of. Wow. Wow. Why, do you, why do you think he picked you? Okay, so uh, one, I think because I didn't press him. Yeah. I think he trusted me in our friendship. And the other thing is he knew he was running out of time. Mm. And not because he knew he was going to get hit. Although he did, he did feel he was paranoid. Most people, when we deal with them as cops, say, oh, the CIA is chasing me. He would say the State Department was after him. Mm. But um, he had stage four cancer on his head, which he attributed to Agent Orange. Mm. So I think in his mind, he knew whose time was running out. He was getting treatment. But So to go back, so he joins the military. He's an Army Green Beret. First, first, he goes into the Army, and they never thought he'd make it through basic. Like, yeah. How can... The rucksack, which they carry in the back, is usually around 60, 70 pounds. He's only 97 pounds. How is even the, yeah. the, all the obstacle courses, how could it even – so no one believed he would make it. He had to get waivers. He had a right to congressmen and stuff for three years to get a medical waiver. So somehow he makes it through basic training. Was he airborne too? He was airborne. Yeah, so then you, first, yeah. then you volunteer yeah. for airborne. It's a volunteer paratrooper. Yeah. So then he's jumping out of planes with equipment that doesn't fit. Yeah. Then they had to strap weights onto him because – the first time he jumps out, he wouldn't descend, so he just float off. Mm. Just, they lose him. Yeah. So I mean, he's ninety-seven pounds. Yeah. It's not enough weight. Yeah. So then there was, you know, so think about like how insane, how incredible, how inspiring, and how tough of a little fuck he had to be yeah. Yeah. to go through this stuff. So he volunteers. So then he becomes an officer, uh, a lieutenant. His first mission when he goes to Vietnam, because Richard's life is always the toughest life. Yeah. His first mission as a platoon leader is during the Tet Offensive, mm. that most people say is one of the most bloodiest battles in the Vietnam War. Right. And you know that's obviously why they become homeless, and we can jump into that. But that PTSD, the thing you got to think about as an officer is you're responsible for bringing these men. They trust you with their lives. Yeah. Bring them home. And he didn't bring all his guys home. Yeah. And for some officers, they'll never live that down, that guilt that they didn't bring. And for Richard, it was, you know, that Ted offensive, he lost a lot of people. Everyone lost a lot of people in that battle. Yeah. So uh, he, was, he was a tough dude, also a little bit of a dick. I uh, heard of times where he, <laughs> I mean, one of, the, one of the, the situations that happened, he pulled out his gun, pointed it at his commanding officer at the time, and he told him, hey, put, you know, put up the gun or I'm going to sh shoot you with my rifle. You know, so there were some little instances where I, I felt as though maybe he, over there, like you said, he might have gotten a little bit of screws loose due to the, the circumstances that he was over there in the war. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he, he was. Everyone, you know, that, that's a good point, that story. Everyone said that he, he was as tough as you get, but he could be a dick. I mean, he yeah. was I mean, he had to always prove himself. Yeah. And, you know, he always had to. Everywhere he went, everything he did in the military, he always had to prove himself, and he always had to stand up to everyone. So, yeah, he had that Napoleonic it's, complex, yeah. and he did some crazy, crazy shit. And <laughs> I mean, if you if you watch the, the show, the documentary, on, the documentary yeah. uh, it's on Prime. and uh, Amazon that, Prime, The Amazon, Giant Killer. Yeah, we, we watched it. I watched not together, uh, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I watched not it. Not that there's anything wrong with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, but it's, it's, it was cool. It, it's it's good, and, uh, yeah. you know, it's... It, a, it takes you through the some of the stories that, that happened happened over there and that's where i learned where he was you know pull out his gun and he was very ferocious out there in the fields as well and so you conducted all those interviews that were in the documentary yeah or? so i went across the country doing you know here here i am just you know trying to do this thing you know week in week out and like sometimes i just felt like how am i going to get this done but yeah. i would just flew across the country and What's really important was those Vietnam vets opened up to me because I didn't know. I'm a stranger. I don't know if they're going right. to talk to me. Yeah. But then they started inviting me to their, their reunions and stuff. And that's when you could really judge a man by the people who served in Vietnam with him. So it was, you have those crazy stories, but the one thing everyone will say is they all respected him mm. uh, and that they all followed him you know, into battle because he would put himself you know, in harm's way before anyone else. That's what I said. So he's 4'9 on paper. Um, NBA NBA paper, I guess. You know, yeah. how they, they his, lie yeah, his, 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 they his fudge the numbers. Little George Santos. Yeah, yeah, so it's called the Santos. But he's also what is it called when they go in the foxholes? There was a Oh, you're thinking a tunnel rat. Tunnel so, rat. So the yeah. tunnel rat story is a little controversial because I did ask him about the tunnel because that's the first thing I thought. I was yeah. like, oh, you're a tunnel rat. He goes, no, 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 I'm an officer. Officers, we don't go into the tunnels. We assign somebody because I'm responsible for my guys. Yeah. But then after his first, after the, that the first few months in Vietnam when he fought in the Tet Offensive, 
Most lieutenants, after they're in vicious battle, they get offered jobs in the rear to do some sort of thing. He wouldn't take it. He mm. took a, a reconnaissance job, a recon. Those are search and destroy guys, yeah. those little units. So he took that, yeah. and those guys said that he would go into the tunnels. <laughs> so I, I think he just couldn't help himself yeah. uh, for the challenge. So he liked, he liked to live on the edge. He liked that. Yeah, so that's... You know, you, you see, you do see that a lot with the special forces guys that you know, and, and guys who've been in war and who survived. There's a, such a huge a, adrenaline dump. They could say walking on the razor's edge. Mm -hmm. that it's almost hard for them to not go back. I interviewed a guy named uh, Chris Tonto Peranto. He's known for he was one of the guys, uh, the contractors. He was an ex army ranger that was one of the contractors in the Benghazi thing. Oh, yeah. And Richard and, and Chris told me, man, he goes, man, that ad adrenaline dump from that battle when you don't know if you're going to come out alive. Yeah. It's, there's no drug. There's nothing on this earth. So in his opinion, uh, he thought Richard, when he was doing his private contract work, my little guy, he was chasing that adrenaline dump. Yeah. And there was also the other aspect that Richard did tell me that he hated communism. And then, you know, when uh, Russia went into China, China, I'm sorry, Russia went into Africa in the 70s, into Rhodesia and trying to, you know, help the spread of communism through some of these small countries, he went over there to fight as an, an advisor. And I don't want to jump any, any chapters or anything, but there was a time where he gets uh, linked up with the CIA or supposedly, I don't know. Supposedly, yeah. All right, moving. We got him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unconfirmed. Yeah. No, actually, um, I was so caught the tail end of it as I'm coming in, and I got out of my car, and I'm just starting to start looking around. I don't know. I just felt like as though, like, hey, man, we might be touching on some crazy stuff. And they might have tapped your phone calls, and they're like, oh, they're going to go on that podcast and talk about some CIA stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it is, uh, it's interesting that, that when, you, when you take away everything, right, and then you start talking about him, and you're looking the way he lived is like it would be a perfect candidate for somebody to work with the CIA. And I think you uncovered it or somebody uncovered Somebody said it in the documentary where it's like, this, you found this passport. Yeah. You want to talk about that real quick? Right. So, and this, so, is, this is where I'm getting this at. This is the like, surprise. Yeah. So, so this is... Do you so, want to talk about that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So at this point in time, guys, this is what we got. We got to... I know the story of him going to Vietnam. I know the story. He, I know he said some of this stuff about um, possible undercover missions, but there's no proof of it until we went inside that storage unit. So this is where the whole story, if it could get crazier, it gets crazier. That time I knew him as a tiny homeless man. His passport revealed he was in Cambodia, he was in Iraq, he was in Venezuela. Nobody knows who he was there for. Nobody knows, I mean, there's people who came out of the woodworks who speculated, but there's nothing on paper. There's no there's you know, paper trail on that. And I, obviously I did my uh, Freedom of Information Acts with the CIA and the State Department, and I got that standard letter. We can neither confirm nor deny the presence of Richard Flaherty. So, yeah, that was, that was really shocking when I found that passport because – you think his missions were over when you know yeah. he's in his he's almost seventy years old and he's still out there. The, the dates on the, the stamp dates were in the time where he was that you knew him. Yeah, that's the that's what makes it crazy. When he's <laughs> living under a tree, he's yeah. still doing these missions around the world. Whoa. Who is he working for? Whoa. What were the missions? Why was he in? He was in. Uh, I forgot the name of the place in Venezuela, but I spoke to some federal guys. It was a small port city in Venezuela, and I'm like. That is one of the most dangerous places for an American to just walk in. That's, yeah. But he did, he did work for Bushmaster Rifles. or th th There was an, another name of the company before it got sold to Bushmaster. And he was uh, a sales rep, and he helped develop weapons. And he was, in the early 70s, working with the Venezuelan government with uh, 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 providing arms. So, and then there's, there's so much crazy shit. There's, he trained uh, Cuban, that's 100%. They trained Cuban rebels out in the Everglades for a possible to overthrow the, the Castro regime. Um, I ended up I ended up interviewing a guy I thought that so he it's would, confirmed that he worked for the CIA or no no that's not confirmed, confirmed but, nor but, deny. so but who, who's is the he, ATF listen okay, the okay. ATF there's an agent ATF agent who I believe 100 percent that everything he told me and and from his information because Richard worked with the ATF in the 80s to bust a crime ring at a Fort Bragg that was wasn't stealing some weapons tons of weapons and explosives yeah. Now, that's where even more CIA shady stuff, because if you look at newspaper articles and you look at the two Green Berets who got arrested, who were allegedly stealing this, they say Richard Flaherty was a CIA agent. He was using us to get weapons down to the uh, anti-Sandinistas in Central America. This was a CIA operation, but it's all falling on us, you know, so, yeah. so yeah. the government doesn't look bad. 
So the, the ATF agent and the, and the federal prosecutor, prosecutors in that case deny it. They say, no, it really was these guys were stealing it for profit. So, but there, there's CIA declassified documents that are still coming out now. There, there's, you know, there's some stuff that I see now, newspaper articles that the CIA shut down that are now being declassified that talk about Flaherty and some of these meetings in the 80s in Central America. So it, it is... It is as wild as it gets. <laughs> it it is. Is just, we should cut right into Justin's face. Right? <laughs> right. Holy moly! Well, and then and, you know, and then only just because I, last if, night I'm watching. But it, it, the whole thing was: here's a homeless person, right? Yeah, a homeless gentleman, and he has a passport that he's been all over the world. Those plane tickets cost money. Yeah, no. So yeah, that's yeah. where the whole question is: like, how? Okay, if he's not working for the CIA yeah. or somebody, how did he get the money to fly around? And go to all these different so parts I, of the world. So I saw his bank account, and there was never any fluctuations. He had about two, three thousand dollars in his bank account, but there was never any crazy. Flu- now, is there an offshore account somewhere sitting with a ton of money? Hey. And I'll tell you, hey. there's so many. Mil- I could talk for days about the million insane things that happened with me and Richard. But one thing that's not in the book, maybe it is in the book. Wait a minute, it's starting uh, to make certain, sense now. Certainly you pulled not. Pulled up in a nice BMW. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know this guy on, real on, good. Hold wait up. a minute. Hold wait a on minute. A second. That a valet could lend it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Some valet kids will lend you any car. For <laughs> Twenty no. bucks. So, so like, the last week of his life was the strangest week of his life. Like, I finally got a guy from my department that had a really good hook with the governor and with the VA hospital and they were going to look into Richard's case and Richard yeah. felt he was being denied all sorts of benefits. That was like amazing. And, and Richard gave me the okay. He said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll go to these meetings. I was going to change Richard's life that last week. Everything was turning to the good before he got killed. So maybe three days before he gets killed, he tells me, Hey Dave, meet me at this apartment. You know, I'm working my shift and it's, it's in my zone. He says, meet me at apartment. Richard had a cell phone too. A uh, little flip phone. So, Okay, what, why am I meeting? So I meet him, and he's in an apartment with a real estate agent. It's not a, the best apartment, but it's nice. It's 170 back then, in that 2015, $175,000 apartment. So he looks at me and goes, Dave, what do you think? I'm thinking of offering them 150 And I'm like, what the? F- <laughs> what is this? Where, yeah. where do you? You're homeless. Where are you going to get 150000 Yeah. So then later he told me that a buddy of his, a real estate guy, was owed him the money and was going to give him the 150 Now, I interviewed that, that real estate guy, and... Under no circumstances was that was that part true. Oh, okay. Richard did not tell me the truth because that that guy didn't know. You know, as a cop, we know when people bullshit us. Yeah. When we hit him with a surprise question, yeah. And he didn't blink at all. He goes, oh, "Buy Richard an apartment. I have apartments. I offered him apartments all the time, and he wouldn't. Li- you know, not the nicest ones, but to live rent free, and yeah. he wouldn't. Where was that money coming from? No effing clue. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> And that's in the new book. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. And wait, wait for the second book because I won't answer that in the first. Yeah. yeah. You know. So, I mean, going back, it's almost like the, you know, it's, it's sad to say because th- these guys are over there. They're fighting for our country, but they're essentially, they're homeless in the jungle. They're learning to live out in, in the thing. And maybe he just felt comfortable under that tree or was he directed to live under, uh, under the tree out as a homeless guy? Who knows? Part of his cover. But it, it, but they feel uh, like a, 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 it's almost like a sense. You get a sense that they, he felt at home, being out under, you know, out of, yeah, just being homeless. Because I, this is what I've at one point in my life, this this crazy point in my life that I'm in Vietnam, you know, I, I can't go back there and relive that. But this, I almost feel like that's like I'm at home. You know, I'm back in that that time. They feel safe, like Richard would. Wherever he stayed, he had little traps, little snares. He would put crunchy leaves around him. He had, you know, th- that's the way he felt safe. He didn't feel secure inside an apartment where he kind of felt trapped. Th- there's a story I just told that um, that I just got. Like, and it, it's that's the point of this thing. It never ends. I just got another Flaherty story. So this is like '72. A bunch of guys. He's from Stanford, Connecticut. A bunch of guys from the neighborhood are in Miami Beach on like a spring break, whatever it was, in 1972. One of the guys who told me the story didn't know Flaherty. But he said uh, one night, they told him another guy from Stanford's coming. So Richard just got out of the military. He was just the, got out of, you know, being a Green Beret. This guy's got the Silver Star, two Bronze Stars, two Purple. I mean, crazy decorated Special Forces hero. So the guy opens the door. He hears a knock, opens the door, and there's Flaherty. So this guy, just the most badass dude in the world, the guy thinks it's a high school freshman. <laughs> like, he doesn't even yeah, know yeah, you're yeah, looking yeah. at the baddest dude on the planet. Yeah. So he goes, some, you know, fresh-faced high school freshman who says, you know, 
he, he's you know coming out with us, and that's how he first met Flaherty. So they go out to, to bars, and they're drinking and everything. And actually, Flaherty got a, a limousine. I guess he wanted to have a good time. So the crazy part of the night was at the end of the night at 3.30 in the morning, as they're driving back to this apartment they rented, Richard says, no, drop me off in this park. And they're all looking at him. It's like a really dense park. And they go, why? He goes, I want to sleep here in the park. Mm. So he didn't feel safe with his friends in an apartment. He'd rather sleep in a park. That's, That's how fucking crazy. That's what I'm saying. It's crazy, man. And and I guess, I mean, it's till to this day after uh, our, our next show, we're going to have a guy who went overseas. He served overseas. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into some of those questions about you know, where you lived over there, the way coming back over here, you hear about it in some movies, you see it where they can't sleep in the bed, where they have to sleep on the floor. Mm-hmm. It's just interesting that uh, I'll, Richard I'll, would I'll want to slap ahead. some perspective on you. Yeah. This is mind blowing. You just you have to visually picture this. There's guys who go to Vietnam for a year living like animals. Those are the guys, the grunts, the infantry, those guys out in the jungle. Yeah. When your year is up, you fly straight home. Nobody talks to you. You go straight two days from being in the jungle, fighting for your life, weapons, yeah. people trying to kill you, every booby trap, poison snakes, to, okay. Go back, yeah. Right, and that shock, yeah. that transitional shock was just too much for a lot of those guys. The one thing I learned about, you know, from interviewing all those Vietnam guys, they all had trouble on their way back. They all, most of them kept the train on the tracks because of their family, their faith, strong friendship. But without those things... They float off like a Richard Flaherty. It's just, it's just too much for a human brain to go from war and killing and living in the jungle to, oh, you're fine, you're done. Go yeah. back on the street and be a normal person. Work in a normal store. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a shock. It's, and Vietnam, and uh, and I could be misspoken here, but it was seen by a lot as you know not our war. Uh, as opposed to you look at world wars where we're fighting against uh, the the Nazis and yeah, for the common the, enemy. Yeah. All, yeah, all those guys. So these when, guys are over there. When they come back, nobody's saying welcome home. There's no parades. There's nothing. Exactly. There is nothing. I you know I, I started finding out so many TV stars. Like there's a guy who on Three's Company, the guy who plays Larry Dallas. Is he's an actor named Richard Klein. Served with the 101st Airborne. Saw some really ugly battles. Never told anybody. There's the guy from Sanford and Son, the actor, the, the son who's Demond Wilson. Same thing. Went to Vietnam, fought, told nobody because it was just, it wasn't accepted. People would hate you right. for it. Yeah. And it's a lot like us as cops now. Yeah. Strangers who don't know me are judging me from one guy, from one incident that, you know, it's one in a million happens. Now you're judging me. Yeah. I feel bad when it happens to me. I can't imagine how shitty these people felt when the, the public turned on them. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, and being in a whole different area, thinking that you're fighting for freedom, and then you come home, and they're like, basically, you know, like we. If if the, the baby protesters, killers. if you have a problem with that, you protest the government, you protest the politicians who sent you, yeah. not the soldiers doing their job. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's not the soldier to make a decision on, on uh, is this a just war? Is it? They're they're going to war. They're trying to be you know patriotic. Your argument is with the the uh, politicians. That's where, and that's a, kind of the same argument that I have or point that I make. It's like it's not law enforcement. We are enforcing a law. You need the law to change in right. order for, you want that changed? You want us to stop enforcing this law? Well, you need that law to change because right now it is legal to do X. Right. So that's kind of the same perspective. It's, it's so, there's so much more than people think answers. Everyone wants the simple answer today. Nobody wants to look at the complex answer. Everyone wants to, how do you fix law enforcement? You got to fix the whole judici- judicial sy- uh, system. It's yeah. the judges. It's the court systems. It's it's not just like, well, people in jail, they don't belong to be in jail. It's the cop's fault. Yeah. Really? What what about the judges? What about the laws? What yeah. about the, you know? Yeah, I think at, at the, when it reaches to a police officer's hands, that's just, there's so much beneath that, that we're just getting the end result and that we have to put handcuffs on a person to take them. But there's so much behind that, what's wrong is that, yeah, you're going to see it at our level because we make the arrest and bad things happen and right. you might get into a struggle and we have to, police work's not pretty, we got to put you down to the ground, oh my God, please. But how did that person get to the point where they meet us? And that's where the issue lies, and that's where yeah. no one really can understand. Just like, oh, the cops are bad. Yeah, well, you take away the cops, there's still going to be that issue, but you're never going to meet that boundary of police. Yeah. It's going to be like, oh, and then victims and victims and victims, and, and they're going to continue doing what they're doing because that's not the police are not the issue. It is whatever is driving that person to meet the police. Yeah. But that's another topic. You brought some pants. 
Yeah. Oh. You want to take a, hey, let's <laughs> let's take take a, a break? Let's take a break real quick. Let's take a well, break. This, this will shock you guys, yeah. your audience. So. All right. Yeah. Let's take a break. We'll be right back. Hey. Hey, come here. Come here. No. Bring it in real close. I got something for you. Did you subscribe yet? Right down there. Hit that subscribe button and the bell notification because you got to know when we're going to give you a show. Do it. Go now. Go now. I'm waiting. Come on. Right there. All right, back to the show. Show me your pants. <laughs> <laughs> you, almost had a spit, you almost had a spit take. Yeah. Show me your pants. <laughs> so so uh, in his storage unit, uh, besides all the documentation and things like that, or some of his uniforms, uh, and this is actually his pants that he wore in Vietnam. Here, let's, so, you, Jay, you want to hold it up? So? Yeah, 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 so I'll go you the background. can see how. Yeah. I mean, it, the thing about Richard Flaherty is... Those are like capris. Right, if you tell somebody what four foot nine is and then you see it, it's... Why don't you just, hold it up in the middle cam, too? It, it just makes go. it so much more re remarkable Look what he that. was able to accomplish because it's just... Until you could picture how small he physically was yeah. um, and the, the amazing things that he did. And those... It's crazy. He wore those pants in Vietnam as a lieutenant. Did he ever wear anything to indicate that he was in the military when he was homeless? Nope. That's the other interesting thing. I mean, think about how much easier his life could have been if yeah. he was telling us he was a homeless vet, he was a Green Beret captain. He didn't. He didn't tell anybody. Right. You guys that. may have been able to like link him up with some with a VA program or different stuff like well, that. Well, he did. Not at the not end. even not at, well, I tried at the end, but yeah. not even that. Just think about just how much, you know, better treatment he would have got from people. Uh, you think it's twofold? Either one, CIA stuff that he was doing, or two, he felt guilty for the stuff that he did in the military. Yeah, I think it's going to be a whole bunch of all that stuff mixed together. Yeah, you yeah. think so? Yeah, because the thing, he, he did, there wouldn't have been one answer to that. It would have been a whole mixture. Yeah, it kind of like uh, I, I listened. To, you guys, if you're if you're, we're, we weren't going to get too far into it because we're getting towards the end. But um, there's a whole bunch more, and there's a lot of little nuanced stories that you have to listen to. Check it out on Amazon Prime, The Giant Killer. Uh, just the search link, it up. We'll have the link in the video, okay. and we'll the, put it on the podcast. The link, but there stuff. are some some crazy stories that they talk about, and uh, you could tell how maybe he had some demons because some of the stuff that he did over there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's that one incident, which it just kind of reminds me a lot of the movie Lone Survivor, where in the movie Lone Survivor, which is obviously a true story, uh, that they, they took a, a hostage, not a hostage, I'm sorry, they, they, they took a, a prisoner, and it was a kid, and they had to decide, you know, he's going to mess up our mission, he's going to give away our position, what do we do? Do we kill him, or do we, you know, risk our own lives? And they made that decision there to let him go, and then you see what happened. The yeah. whole unit got wiped out. You're talking about in Lone Survivor. In yeah. Lone Survivor. Yeah. So that was a situation once with Richard on a double mission, it's in the documentary. It's controversial. And that's the thing is I could have cut out things in the in the documentary to make him look um, as pure. And But I needed to tell the story the way it really was so yeah. people can really understand. And that, that was a situation where they uh, they took some prisoners and Richard's unit was exposed. And the enemy, it was a very, uh, they were in an enemy area where they, they were being hit before many times. And Richard wanted to get out of there. And he said, hey, I think it's they, they have to go. And, uh, you know, that's controversial. This but I'm, I was never in his shoes to judge him. I was never there Absolutely. where I had to bring those men home and say, is it their lives or those prisoners' lives that matter? You're in a, you're in a different, unimaginable situation yep. that, that he had to go through and, situ and uh, decisions he had to make out there. And I'm sure that he was dealing with those decisions uh, coming back to, it's almost like you disconnect and you come back to the uh, quote unquote real world, which is you know the way we live here. And you're like, holy shit, what did I do over there? Yeah. That's nuts. So uh, you know, and and you can you could bury that for a long time. Eventually, it's gonna come up and bubble up. Yeah. Um. So this guy here, he's he's been on crazy missions. He's been in foxholes. He got shot at. Um, grenades blew up next to him. All this stuff happened to him. He lives under a tree and he gets hit by a car. That's how that the story ends of this guy's life. Uh, life, not not the story, but his life ends there. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. Like, the creation of new. New stories so, for him ended there. There's a couple couple questions um, because in the documentary it says he was walking, it was clear line of sight. The guy's walking there. He doesn't, he's not dart, he didn't dart out into traffic. Um, 
you said I, he had stage four cancer. Maybe a little suicide. Maybe I'm not the end. I told this guy my life story, and I told him to look into it, and I just want to end it because I'm going to die anyways. I'm going to go into my, I don't know, the DUI, I had an issue with it. You want to tell a little bit about the incident, and then I'm telling you, you guys, watch this stuff. Watch it on uh, Amazon Prime, and then you guys can come up with a conclusion of yourself. But go ahead. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it was a suicide, but of course anything is possible. I do know he was, he, he spoke to his cousins. He, those are the only people in his family he spoke to were his cousins. And his only fear was to die in a hospital of cancer. That is true. Um, but um, the, the thing is. So it's late at night. It, it, it's late at night. Um, I think it was after 12, after 12 maybe. So it's starting the next day. He's crossing the street. He gets hit by a Prius. He flies about 15 feet in the air, uh, lands. Uh, he's probably still semi-conscious. He's bleeding out in the, uh, in the bushes. And the car flees. Um, we, we pulled the video, obviously. We, we picked up the video. And we had an open homicide investigation. So we're pulling video. We got pieces of the car to match. Um, and then... My the, the lead investigator was a guy named Harvey Arango, our traffic homicide lead investigator. He gets a call from the Miami-Dade Homicide Unit, and they said, we think we have the subject of your hit and run here. So Harvey's like, why would they turn themselves in there? And they're like, well, she's one of our employees. Oof. So um, my guy raced over there and, and did the interviews and everything. This is where it gets, you know, uh, this is where it gets things go, go a little bit sideways. I mean, the whole fucking thing is sideways. But this is where yeah. it really goes sideways yeah. is, you know, she kind of really took her time before turning herself in. She certainly knew she hit my friend that night. How she can, she claims it, that it was a palm frond, that she didn't know if she hit a barrier or something. After she hits my friend, she walks back to the crime scene, claiming that she didn't know what she hit. She lived maybe three blocks away. She parked a car. And we pulled the video of her, and it's in the documentary, of her walking around her car, checking the car. There's blood on the car. The car front, this is on the Prius, they have that little side window. That thing was smashed. The A-frame, that big metal bar on your window, was smashed. I mean, if you hit a 97-pound man uh, in, a, in a Mack truck or a Hummer, maybe you can say, I didn't know. But he landed on the, on the hood of the car. He bounced. He flew in the air. How she can claim she didn't see him. Um, and then she gets into work and she tells the story. So the th where everything really just goes sideways is my department finishes our paperwork, you know, ready to do the arrest, and the state attorney comes forward and just says, there's just not enough evidence that she hit, knew she hit a human being, Oof. and we're not going to charge her, you know, nothing. And my department said, yeah, we're going to arrest her. And I said, well, you arrest her, and you're opening yourself up to all the several ramifications because we don't believe there's enough evidence to prosecute her. Wow. Okay, so yeah. that's how it ends. And, and not only and that, there was a, a call to the insurance where she she admits that she hit something. And right, she doesn't so know what it was. So that yeah, so the night of the you know of the, uh, the so there's evidence run. there. Yeah, the, I mean the night of the hit and run, she's not calling the police after this big crash. She's calling her insurance company to get someone out first thing in the morning to fix her car. She wanted mm -hmm. her car. You know, I don't go too much into her. Uh, I tried making contact. Um, my opinion about her is a, is a person, besides having an alcohol problem, is uh, uh, severely disturbed, mentally disturbed, from people I've talked to and videos I've seen of her. She, she her. went viral in another video that we were discussing, maybe off break, that this lady is not the, and, and not even from this incident, from another incident. <laughs> right. I don't know if you, you have it or did you we were able to pull that no, up. Oh, I didn't look it up. Ah, well, what what is she? Basically, millions of views. She's in uh, her department's uniform. She's not a police officer. She's a civilian. Civilian employee. Yeah. She's a court sonographer from Miami-Dade Homicide. And remember, guys, let's not put anything on Miami-Dade Homicide. They had nothing, you know. Yeah. There was no cover-up. There's nothing like that. They, they immediately turned her over to us. But um, she was up in Boca Raton. So this is about a year and a half ago. She was up in Boca Raton wearing a Miami-Dade police homicide jacket. And I guess she got into a little fender bender in a parking lot, and she was drunk, and she's screaming and yelling, and she goes into a lot of really anti-Semitic stuff, calling people Jews and uh, dirty Jews and all sorts of stuff, Democrats <sighs> and dirty Jews. 
The crazy part of the story is allegedly she's Jewish, but I, I don't know anything about her. But that video went viral. It, it was spread around the world, you know, because of the, how nasty it was, the anti-Semitism with somebody wearing a police jacket. Yeah. People not knowing that's not really a cop and blah, blah, blah. I mean, Miami Dade immediately put out a, you know, a statement saying that she doesn't work for us anymore and we have nothing to do with her. This she is the same lady that, that killed my friend. Killed your friend. So. You know, she's not famous for killing my friend, but she gets famous. But, you know, it is what it is. Wow. And do um, you think his background had something to do with everything? What does your gut tell you as far as this and everything that's, you know, what can you – I know as a, as a former police officer, you're still a cop at heart, and you don't want to make any uh, accusations. But what do you say, like, if you had to start in a direction to say, let's solve the reason or whatever, where would you go with that? Well, are, are, are you saying like the the idea that this could possibly be a hit? Uh, I'll, well, let, let's 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 talk about what Richard told me really quick because this is even going to make it ins insinuated even more. The only one thing Richard didn't want me looking into was the undercover case he worked with the ATF, uh, with uh, the agent's name was Gluffy. That was the only thing he said, Dave. I want you to cover my whole life story, but don't. But I'm a detective, and I need to know all the facts, so I did contact the agent. I found him. It took me a couple of days to get Agent Gluffy's phone number. That was the week that Richard was alive. So I called that agent on f Friday, May 8th in the afternoon. I call him. I'm, that's my first contact with him to find out if this, any parts of this ATF undercover operation story are true. And the agent says everything he told you is true. That night, Richard gets killed. So here you have Richard telling me, do not – Contact these people because it's going to be bad for your career and dangerous for my health. Yeah. So obviously, yes, the first thing I thought was, holy shit, I just got my friend killed in a hit. Ooh. Yeah. It triggered something. But ex extraordinary accusations require extraordinary proof. Exactly. And it just never, I've never found any evidence that she was some sort of plant from the CIA or that she was given some sort of instruction to kill him and, and you know, think about how hard that would have been to set up that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, and then when you see the, the video of her being drunk, that's the obvious, most obvious, yeah. you know, choice. It's just, uh, I don't know, coincidental? Coinc coincidental is that, you know, obviously, li hey. listen, the minute I heard he was, you know, I got a knock on my door at 5 a.m. for one of my guys in uniform that next day saying, you know, Dave, you know, your friend just got killed. And I'm like, the first things in my mind is, holy shit. Yeah. He told me not to contact the agent. But, you know, that was just coincident. Yeah, and that's so fresh in your mind because it just happens. So Right. So wow. it's like, you know, just what a strange set of circumstances that occurred. Okay, so uh, we we have to have evidence as police officers. Right. We could have a hunch. Right. But we also are like coincidental. Ha <laughs> ha right. I think not. You know, and then you have to dig and figure out, you know, but maybe maybe yes, maybe no, who knows. Listen, um, anything in this world is possible. Yeah. And obviously, you know, I a lot of the people who follow the story, that's their first thing is I don't care what the officer says, this was a hit. Hmm. I'm not there yet, guys. I mean, I need to see something. I, yeah. I'm still digging. And if somebody's got something, I'm still digging. But I'm just that's looking at it bro. as a DUI so with a person who was familiar with the system and who had to get around it. <sighs> and, and the question is, well, why didn't the state attorney charge them? State attorney, I spoke to them and, you know, as much as I could, it wasn't my case. Yeah. But my guys did press for, for the arrest. Uh, they went back to a, a, a Supreme Court, Florida Supreme Court case, similar to what I said earlier, where a giant truck ran over a kid on a skateboard, and the guy had no idea he hit the kid on the skateboard, and that was his defense. And they said, well, in that case, it was a hit and run, and he didn't know. Yeah, that was a huge SUV. We're talking about a Prius where he hit the front. She knew she hit my friend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless she was so incoherent at the time of driving you know that how else could you not have seen a hundred pound man who smashes your windshield flies in the air his shoes fly off and you saying i don't know i hit a human being i was looking f at the video because there's a video of the lady that she uh, she steps out of her apartment she goes into her apartment steps out and walks circles her vehicle looks right. at the damage and i'm looking for that those steps that are maybe out of line I'm like right. I, I, I need some evidence saying that this lady was on drugs she just looks Man, I don't know. It's hard to say, but she just looks wacky. Yeah. She just looks like a, a wacky lady. Yeah, but the other thing is she is wearing high heels, and she's not stumbling as yeah. bad as someone. So, listen, she certainly could have had a very high blood alcohol content and just being, you know, one of those people that can handle her alcohol yeah. better than others. But yeah, it's a tough case. Mm. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's interesting. It's inter interesting that... 
he held all this stuff uh, for so long. Then he opens up, and shortly after, he's dead. So that's kind of crazy. Yeah, it's just coincidence. I don't, I don't know. It's it's tough, man. But I'm glad you're here to to, to tell it, and I'm glad you're continuing to dig uh, on this and um, and find out maybe maybe it was a hit. Maybe you don't want to find that out, you know, because we need you back on the show, man. They always yeah. say, don't ask questions, you know. Exactly. There are some things like, you know, will someday I ever go to Venezuela and follow? I have the clues to follow his path. I know the hotels he stayed at. I, will I ever do that someday? Yeah, maybe. Well, maybe there'll be a part two. It wouldn't be the first time that you had a hit out on you. No. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, and I mentioned, so, so I mentioned when, when I was talking to Nick. You want to talk about that? Or? Yeah, we, well, can, we, we can go. Let's hook up because up. we're getting towards the end of yeah. the time. Uh, I'll tell you guys. I'll tell you guys just real quick. I grew up in a, in a in a section in Brooklyn. This is BC before cop. Before cop. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I grew up as a kid growing up. Yeah. And there were some guys whose fathers were in the mob, and th- those were our friends, and you know we were all just friends, and that's what happened. And there was one day I just had a run in with the wrong guy, and I didn't know. I kind of had an idea that there was someone out there looking for me, but I didn't know how bad things could get for me until I spoke to a buddy that I haven't spoken to in 15 years, and he said, uh, you were that guy he was looking for? Uh, I'll <laughs> save that story for the next time I'm on. Yeah, and he wasn't, he wasn't just a normal guy. Yeah, this he guy was, was a lunatic. He was a lunatic. An animal, as you would call yeah, him. Yeah, he was, he was in what we would consider a mob associate. He could never be made because he was half Italian, half... And he ended up getting killed. Uh, he got shot 45 times. Wait, uh, yeah. We, yeah. yeah. Let's hold on to that. All right. Let's hold on to that because that one's that one's uh the that was a good one. All right. That's what I said. We so I called I called you to reach out five minutes. Just hey, you want to come on the podcast, talk a little bit about the story, and we just ended up shooting the breeze for like an hour and forty five minutes. Yeah. So it was a good conversation. I'm like, dude, you're local. We need to link up. And you're like, hey, my brother, let's go. When when you want to do it. So thank you for coming and and, and uh, sharing with us. Some of the story, you guys, I urge you to go on to Amazon Prime. And now you have the book that's going to be available. When? Is it available oh, now? Oh, that's books available already. Books available There's something now. you said in two months coming. So I'm coming out with the second book. There you the, go. The Giant Killer book, it's been out for two years, and it's also an audio book. And, yeah, I and suck at doing research. No, no worries, <laughs> brother. No worries. Um, but, but what happened is when I, had a, I have social media pages, I started learning other people were telling me about other soldiers who did incredible things. So I would do little write-ups about their stories and people said, hey, can you do a combi- combination book with all these soldiers? So that's what I'm going to be coming out with next in about two months. So it's just stories from all these people that you met all, that all the these- audience ask you yeah, or, or they, you know, they said, "Hey, do you know this guy's story?" So then I would research it, and I do a little write up on the social media page. And they said, "Can you make a, a book with all these incredible heroes in one book?" And I said, "Sure." So that, that's, that's what awesome. I'm try to come out. So with. I thought I found it interesting that uh, you know you got I can see you got the Facebooks. You know what I mean? Yeah. For sure, you got the Facebooks. Yeah. You know what I mean? But now I, I'm like, "Hey, who's this guy in the Tiki Talks <laughs> over here?" You got a big following on Tiki Talks. Yeah that, yeah, that was really, really fast. What, um, what happened? Started, it exploded I, real quick. Yeah, I started TikTok maybe six months ago, and I was very reluctantly. I had a cousin that, that knew about it, and I was like, ah, you know, I don't know. People dance, do the chicken yeah. dance on their way. What, what is it going to do? Why would my audience be on there? Why would people who care about the military? But they were all on there. And, and the interesting thing about it, and I'm not I'm going to work for TikTok or I'm promoting, is just... I'm just telling the raw story like I'm telling you guys, and yeah. just people found it interesting. And there's no flashing, and there's no dancing, and there's no nothing. It's yeah. just telling a, a real story about a, an incredible person. You, but the first couple of videos on there, I saw your dance moves. Oh, you did? Yeah, you story. All right. TikTok. That's not how you do it. That's not how you do it. No, no. All right. You, you caught I'm, me. I'm right. just kidding. I'm no, no, no. But kidding. listen, I'll pay you that money on the side. Right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, you got the 20. You guys right, should have right, a 20 yeah. right 20 now. Days. There you go. The silence you on that one. All right. Well, uh, you're going to come back. 100%. All right. Absolutely. Oh, we love it. So you're on TikTok. TikTok uh, handle is The Giant Killer, correct? The, the Giant Killer, Facebook, Instagram, The Giant Killer. Um, just jumped onto LinkedIn, uh, f- made some really great contacts on there. But you guys can find the book in the movie. It's on Amazon. Uh, Spotify just picked us up. The oh, audio book, uh, Voodoo, Roku, YouTube, Google Play, all those things w- were on there. Uh, and, you know, thank you so much for everyone who supports this project. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough for everyone who cares about Captain Flaherty. I can't thank you enough. 
the man died on the side of the road, you know, and we're now keeping his memory alive. Yeah, it's awesome. Awesome so, stuff, dude. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it's just riveting, riveting stuff. So yeah. it's, I, I did watch the documentary, uh, most of it so far. I was just catching up, and, and, and it's, it's, it's really cool. So check it out. Yeah. And awesome to have you here. Thanks for coming. Can't wait to have you back. We're going to talk about some more stuff in that mob hit. <laughs> hey, forget about it. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. All right. Cheers. Salud, Cheers, my man. brother. Calling all units. Calling all units. Donut Shot has a fresh dozen. Go ahead and take a 1040. <laughs>